Hi everybody, welcome back. Let me stop the camera from shaking here. Well, here's my next experiment, huh? Looks ridiculous, but hey. I got one of my ball caps, clipped the, the microphone on there, ran the cord, and we're going to see how this works. I can see from the little graphs on the camera here that uh, it is picking up the sound pretty well. So we'll see what happens. I don't know what kind of background noise it's going to get up here, but we'll see. Maybe I can try also adjusting the record level down. All right, I'm back. How's that? Is that better? I don't know. You'll have to let me know. So first of all, I want to thank you all. I'm kind of overwhelmed by all the comments I've gotten on the last couple videos and so forth. I'm really happy about that. I appreciate it. I, uh, again, my goal on this channel, I, I'm a little bit different. I'm not here to collect likes and subscribes, you know, and the smash like or slap like or click like. I don't care about that stuff. This is a fun hobby for me. I share it on video and I don't make a living at it and never will. <laughs> so this is all fun for me. And the thing I enjoy the most is when we get comments going and we exchange information. You know, I read a lot of the forums, uh, DIY Audio, Audio Karma, Video Karma, those different places. And they're great forums. And it's all typewritten stuff, a lot of reading. And really what I think would be cool if this channel evolved into is I put a video out, even with all my imperfections and <laughs> mistakes that you guys pick up but get the get the ball rolling on something you know on a piece of a gear and then get the comments going almost like on a forum where we can freely exchange information so and I see that happening more and more on this channel so I really that I'm really jazzed by that I appreciate it so let's look at what our next project's going to be and uh, see what kind of trouble we can get into this time huh so what we have before us here is an another piece of SAE gear. It's a Mark 9 preamp with equalizer. And before we even start on this, uh, I want to get some comments from you guys and gals, whoever, on your thoughts of graphic equalizers. So one unique feature about this preamp and to my understanding, I'm not an SAE expert, but this was not one of their most high-end units. It was a, kind of a mid-grade preamp from them. But I want to talk a minute about the equalizer thing. You know, back in the 1970s, the equalizers got popular, and we all kind of went down that path for a while. At one point, I had a 21-band equalizer. I mean, it had more little slider thingies than a shark's got teeth. And I found myself, I don't know about you all, but, you know, you'd start doing this. You know, the inverted bell that they talk about, you know, make the inverted bell pattern. And then you would mess around and it, you'd drive yourself crazy because no matter what you did, you just felt like you could tweak it a little more and just get that little better sound out of it. And at the end of the day, I would have to walk away from the whole system <laughs> let my brain reset and I'd come back and everything would be flat and that's how it sounds good and uh, but that being said listening areas areas are not always perfect right so your speaker distance from where you're where you're positioning yourself versus the speakers the crossovers of the speaker the the room conditions all these things affect the sound and an equalizer can be a good way to compensate for some of that and that was kind of the justification for it but in the same token when you take the time to set up your listening room to set up your system some of the most expensive high-end preamps you can buy will have one knob on them volume <laughs> and that's not even a pot it's usually a stepped attenuator so where do you all stand on this what do you think about having an equalizer is it an advantage a disadvantage is it something that you 
include in your audio hobby or is it something that you tend to shy away from and go for the more simplistic uh, with either the bass and treble or just the straight through clean preamp with just the volume let me know down in the comments I'm really interested in knowing about that now this one of course does have a five band equalizer it does not have a loudness switch so at low volumes it doesn't have enhancement to certain uh, certain frequencies like you would if you had a loudness switch on some of the other preamps it does have you can run this amp flat by hitting the EQ defeat button it also has you can have these you can change the slope of, of the sliders here to either 8 dB of gain or cut or 16 dB of gain or cut. And of course you have your typical tape copy and headphone, <laughs> you know, where, where you're monitoring and also for tape dubbing and so forth. Interesting up here, stereo mode, reverse stereo mode of course, and then mono, you can play just channel A or just channel B. I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Two phono inputs, and from the looks of this, and I could not we'll get into this later for the service manual, but couldn't find a lot of information. But it looks as if just it's a very simple phono stage on this. I don't know how high end or low end it is. So you have two phono inputs, a tuner input and an auxiliary input for your mp3 player or your cd player or whatever very simple controls if you take this away take your sliders for your EQ you have balance and volume so in some ways if we hit this defeat this is a very simple straight through preamp and spoiler alert I did take the, the curiosity got the better of me so before the video <laughs> I just couldn't stand it I popped the cover off to look at what's inside and I was very impressed. Uh, I, we'll go over that in a, in a minute. Let's turn this thing around. And the rear of the preamp is just as simple as the front. Uh, you have your inputs for your phonos, your tuner, your auxiliary, your tape loop, and then your one output. And a uh, little bit tarnished contacts, but we can clean those jacks pretty easily. And then your AC convenience outlets and your fuse and your cord, and that's it. Now, on the bottom, you can access this thing from the bottom and the top panel. They can be removed so you don't have to take the chassis all the way apart to service it, I guess. And this one is missing its feet. But fortunately, I keep my feathers numbered for just such an emergency. Ode to Foghorn Leghorn. So we have some spare feet, and we're going to attach those so that this thing will sit up, you know, level. Anyway, let's pop the cover and look inside. Okay, so here's the innards of this thing, and it's really interesting the way they built this thing. Here's your power supply, and again... I have no service manual for this and the strange thing is I went online even to some of the pay sites where you actually pay for the service manual and I was unable to find any service documentation whatsoever for this usually there'll be like something floating around out there it might be an, an early copy or a real blurry looking you know <laughs> not incomplete copy of something but there other than advertisement information there is nothing out there schematic or service manual wise on this preamp it does show that it has a frequency response I found a few things like the frequency response is something like 10 Hertz up to you know above our audio hearing range the you know low pretty low distortion you know in the fractions of a percent uh, things like that but not very much else so right off the bat you can see there's a linear power supply you have your little transformer down there and you have one two three four five hundred microfarad capacitors well actually three five hundreds and a one thousand 
and they're rated at 50 volts it looks like a 2N3055 and I'm assuming that's going to be kind of a current pass for the regulator this might possibly here's your bridge rectifier down here just a tiny you know four little diodes I don't know if you could see them those little blue and black diodes and I'm assuming this here would be a Zener diode that they're using with these resistors to set up the, the regulated voltage for the pass transistor here. And then that comes out of there and it goes to the actual preamp circuit which is here. And I'm thinking, again, this is all right off the cuff because I'm just kind of looking. I'm thinking we have our preamp section or our uh, phono connectors over here so probably I don't know where our RIAA stuff is but these here seem to be your final outputs that that go to the output section these larger transistors here and maybe our the RIAA is up here someplace. I'm not sure. Tip that so you can see it a little closer down in there. And then here's our selector switches. They have their own circuit board. And look at the size of those slider potentiometers. I, I am not, I'll, be, I'll admit it, I am not a fan of these slider potentiometers. They have a tendency to get a lot of dirt and crud in them through the front. And they get noisy and they get loose and they've just been known to have problems but look how big these ones are I think these are probably a lot higher quality than the ones I'm used to seeing out there and the coolest thing of all look at the filter network for the equalizer look at those coils how high quality they are and really nice quality film capacitors I'm assuming those are uh, Cornell Dublier or some, you know, high end, you know, a, a good quality capacitor. No, they're not, you know, a zillion dollar Mundorfs or whatever, but hey, <laughs> very good quality. So this should be a decent performing little preamp. And by the looks of it, it doesn't look like anybody's ever worked on it. And uh, I don't know. Let's just try it out and see if it works. All right, we're really going to give this new microphone configuration a workout. We are getting a really good thunderstorm outside, which is good. We kind of need some rain, and I kind of find the storms relaxing, so it's good stuff. Uh, I have this turned on and plugged in, and the first thing I notice is the little power indicator light is not working, so we'll have to address that. I haven't cleaned anything, nothing. I connected my signal generator with my splitter cable. So that's going into the auxiliary input and just coming out of the main output and into the oscilloscope. And here's our settings. I have the equalizer defeated for now. Balance is in the center and I have a 1.5 volt RMS output. Now, somewhere when I was doing some research on the internet, what I was told is that high impedance output, in other words, an unloaded output coming out of this preamp, this thing should be able to produce a maximum of 18 volts. Now I don't know if they were they meant 18 volts RMS or 18 volts peak to peak, but we are going to check that out on our scope and let's make sure we can measure the peak to peak voltage as well. Right there. Right? So now we're going to get peak to peak and RMS. So I think 1.5 volts RMS should be enough to drive this thing all the way as far as it can go. So let's see what happens. 
this is kind of a sticky volume control and there's clipping and there's okay so we're getting a little bit of clipping at 12 volts RMS and it's 35 volts peak to peak so it is not 18 volts either way it's more than 18 volts when it comes to now of course that might be 18 volts peak which would be half of the peak to peak which means and I can give you that measurement too let's see if it'll do that uh, let's see now I don't think this one has peak I don't think it shows nope we don't have that measurement on this anyway there you go so roughly getting into clipping there's your 36 or 37 volts and you can see we're getting and just the pots a little bit noisy I'm jiggling the pot and you can see it's clipping on the one channel it's clipping on the top cycle and on the other channel it's clipping on the bottom but that's with the volume all the way to maximum so I have 1.5 volts RMS going in all the way maximum and that's what we get out so for not having cleaned this thing or done anything it's working that's a good thing I now have the signal generator set up to do a from 10 Hertz to 20 kilohertz sweep just checking the linearity we're still in tone defeat mode so we're just doing no no equalizer I have the two channels superimposed over one another so what that means is that if there's any amplitude imbalance in the preamp we should see it here because you'll see that blue kind of going over or under the yellow trace so let's hit start and we have it set between these two graticules here and you can see it's as you would expect very very linear if there was a problem with a coupling capacitor or something in this preamp you would see it would affect the frequency now let's come out of defeat and we're now I have all the tone sliders set to flat and while this is still going we're gonna come down here make sure these are all flat and they are and then we're gonna go over here and we're going to put that on and it should not change anything it should still be just the same and if you look it is not okay so you can see just a little bit where it's not tracking properly and that's probably because and you can see and strangely enough when I move the slider it's only affecting the one channel so I'm, I'm moving the 80 Hertz slider and you can see it has no effect on the yellow channel but the blue channel it does let's do the other one here that one's not doing very much that's the 320 okay here is the 1280 so not doing much there you go you could see it go through the dip I have it down now let's wait till it sweeps through it again see there now let's move the 5000 Hertz one and you can see they're not going linearly though the two channels are not and then here is the 15 kilohertz and you can see how with only that one <laughs> it rolls off and then it rolls back up so the tone controls are not working so well and there's I don't know why that is probably because the controls are dirty among other things but at least 
on this slider it does affect both channels although unequally but on this one it only affects one channel so the equalizer is not working so well alright so I now have the output set as close to 10 volts RMS as I could get and I'm going over now you can see I have the T piece connected in there and we're connected into our Keithley and there's our THD right there so we have 0.007 percent THD at 1 kilohertz with 10 volts RMS out and I'm putting about 2.070 volts RMS in and I have the volume set near maximum and I have the tone defeat set on again because obviously the EQ needs a little bit of work so that's a pretty clean preamp that's a good thing so here's the setup for this I have the reverse RIAA adapter connected I'm in tone defeat I have phono 1 selected the volume has not moved from our last test we just did with the when we did the THD so we should get somewhere around our 10 volts output if everything's perfect with the same input and here is the 2.070 RMS so coming over to the scope a little bit more gain and you can see you have 11 volts there and that's partially because of the RIAA curve on this I think I don't know but of course the reverse RIAA filter should remove that so really the best way to test this now is we're gonna drive this back down until we get our 10 volts oh. Oh. there and you can see the channels are a little bit imbalanced and let's check these connectors back here yeah that's what I thought these connectors are very very badly tarnished back here and I think that has something to do with it so there that's about as good as we're gonna get it until I clean those connectors on the back they're very tarnished so let's move over to our sweep signal and not perfect but let's uh, see if we can change the amplitude a little bit here so that sorry there get it close anyway all right so you can see the RIAA curve according to our little module is pretty close it's not perfect it's still got a little bit of a little bit of gain on the low frequencies and it has a little bit of drop off on the high frequencies but that could be my filter that I have on there it's not perfect they're not perfectly linear but what this means if the if the RI let's let me just show you what would happen if we if we did not have our reverse RIAA filter on there okay first of all without the reverse RIAA I have to turn the input way way down and that's even going to be really high for a moving magnet actually let's turn it down even more I'll just drop it a little bit and and yes that's not correct for a, for a uh, magnetic cartridge I know that but I just want to show you what happens <laughs> when you don't have that little adapter module so you can see the modules not plugged in and I'm just going straight into the phono input with the kit with the cord and let's see what this does now in the phono stage without the reverse RIAA adapter and you can see it's 
clipping really bad and then even with that 50 millivolts as you go higher in frequency you see what it's doing it's cutting the highs and boosting the lows and this is the opposite of how a vinyl record is recorded so when they record when they actually cut the groove on the record the low frequencies are attenuated down and the high frequencies are attenuated up or boosted up so this curve that's built into the preamp the phono stage counteracts that so really what this little module we were using is doing is it's mimicking what the record is doing in other words the, this is this does the opposite of this pretends to be a record if that if that makes any sense to you so the this is good because this is with an un, with an unfiltered signal that doesn't have those filters on it you want to see the low frequencies have higher amplitude and the high frequencies have lower amplitude and that's exactly what's happening here so the phono stage works although the connectors are really dirty so other than doing some cleaning of the controls and so forth I have a feeling uh, this preamp is going to be ready to go we can try it out by the way, in case some of you folks are new to the channel, I actually did a video on what these are and how they work. And then we got one of these from an online seller at eBay and we built it. It comes in a little kit like this and we built it. And this is what it looks like when it's done. And it works. We, we lined them up and they actually were very similar to one another. This is a commercially made one that I ordered from a while back. I got it from Hagerman Audio. And then this one, I don't know if it'll focus here. There you can see it, Hagerman Audio Labs. And this is the kit. And believe it or not, this thing was very, very inexpensive from eBay. And it worked just as well as this. So check out the video, there, it's, I think it's called Reverse RIAA, and yeah, one of these days I need to learn how to put those little linky things in the upper corner of the screen. I'm just too lazy to do that, you know, but I really need to do that. Anyway, back to the video. So after our test, we've determined we need to do a couple of things here. First of all, we need to clean the controls. We need to make sure that after we clean all the controls and switches, that the equalizer is working we need to replace or repair the indicator light and we need to go on the back and clean these horribly tarnished connectors back here and this you've all heard me say this before if you're a regular viewer of the channel oh boy my lights just flickered I think the lightning's hitting and I think we might lose power here. <laughs> we'll see. If the lights go out, I have the battery in this camera, so it'll keep going, but it'll get really dark down here. Anyway, with these cleaning products, there are different cleaning products that I use for different applications. And if I take this out, anything made by this deoxit it's very popular everybody recommends it everybody uses it and i agree it's a great product i use it all the time but these anything with the letter the number five so d5 f5 that means five percent of this is the actual deoxit product and 95 percent of it is a cleaning solvent kind of like what this is the problem is these are designed to leave a residue that is what protects the contacts or the controls that you're spraying them onto. They also get absorbed into the uh, to the uh, bakelite or to the fiber wafer of the pot itself or the control itself, which keeps it from drying out and shrinking. So this is good stuff and it and once you treat it with this it'll last a very long time 
The problem is when you start to use this stuff as a cleaning agent, the more of this you spray as a cleaning agent, the more of that of that byproduct, the, the D5 product, the deoxid product, you're putting onto the circuit as well. Until finally it kind of leaks out and gets onto everything and makes everything all gummy and it actually is counterproductive. So my process for doing this is I will always take a lower cost contact cleaner like this and this is a great example this is something you can usually find at a hardware store or an auto parts store or something like that and there's a couple things that I always look for these are all about the same chemicals they just come from different manufacturers CRC is a popular one here in the states but you want it to be quick drying and you want it to be safe for plastic and you want it to leave no residue. If you don't have those three traits on characteristics, it's not going to do what I'm going to recommend here for this. This is what I use for cleaning. Number one, this is a fraction of the cost of these. So if you need to use a lot of this to clean out a particularly dirty control, you're not wasting this expensive product. This is only a few dollars for a big can. This is, you know, 15 or $20 for a small can. So you don't want to use this stuff just to waste it to clean and then rinse it out. You want this for this product. So what I do is I use this first to clean the, clean the controls. Now what that's going to do is it's going to remove the tarnish. It's going to do things like that. But it's also going to dry the oils out of that control, which leaves it very vulnerable to future corrosion and so forth. So it cleans it, but now you want to put a little bit of a protectant and that's when I come in with this and just very sparingly use a small amount of this to put a protective coating. Now for sliders and faders they have this type. It's a little bit different compound from this. So for the rotary pots and for switches and things like that we use this. And for the slider controls, you use the green stuff, which is the fader lube. And that's what we have here. So that's what we're going to do. We've really taken this thing apart now. You can see I took all the covers and everything off. Took the faceplate off. And now we can get to these controls. And like I said, I start with the CRC. And we just put a little shot of this in there and then just work the control back and forth. And we're just going to work it back and forth till it cleans it really well. And we're going to let it mostly evaporate. And you can see it's pretty much evaporated in there. And then we're going to come by with our fader lube. And we're just going to put a little in the top. I don't want it to run down inside so we're going to set it upright like this and just give it a little bit at the top and let it run down and then just work it into the control and that's all you need. You don't need any more than that just just a small amount and then I just go through and clean up the excess with a rag and if you look inside there, that doesn't evaporate. It stays in there. See that? So I'm going to go through and do the rest of these, and then we'll be back. All right, last but not least, we have these connectors that we need to clean off, all the jacks. And you can see a little before and after, so you can see how tarnished these things are and how bad they are. But all you need is a rotary tool. Let me back up the camera rotary tool and a uh, little wire brush and you just clean it up. Okay we have the preamp all about back together all the controls are cleaned and I have the signal generator and the scope connected back up and you can see I'm at about half volume I have the EQ turned on right now and I have all of them set to flat on the signal generator, I don't know if you can see that, but 
I have 80 Hertz, which corresponds with this first right here, the first slider. And when everything's flat, you can see we have a pretty good looking waveform there on both channels. But watch what happens when we go up on the 80 Hertz. You can see one channel, not only does it go up in amplitude more rapidly, the taper is different, but you can see it actually shifts the phase of it. Now, the frequency is the same. Both of them are 80 Hertz. So it's not changing the frequency of the two channels. But you can see this channel is actually the phase is shifting on it. So not only is the amplitude shifting, but the phase is shifting. Your zero cross point. You see that? They line up right about when you get, if you look when you're at flat. And then when you go down, you can see the phase shifts again. So we either have a bad potentiometer, in other words, the taper between the right and the left side of that slider is bad, or we have a bad component in there of some sort, like a bad capacitor or something. This is one of the reasons I'm not real fond of the slider controls, because they tend to do this. <laughs> At least in my, my experience, I mean, you all can share with me what, what your experience is, but I have seen a lot of this on not SAE, but just about anything, especially mixing boards and things like that when they get old, some of the pro sound stuff out there. That's what happens with these sliders. Uh, the other thing I noticed between the two channels is when we go up in amplitude, let's change this. So now I'm at 5 volts per division. And when I go up in amplitude, you can see they track really well until you get to a certain point. And look, the blue channel, once again, it begins to clip on one side while the other channel is still going up. And if I continue even further, we can finally get the other channel to start clipping. And you can see the other channel clips fairly symmetrically. So you look, it's clipping at top and bottom. That is normal. This is not. So part of me thinks there might be a problem with the transistor because there, now I'm in the EQ defeat. And now I have defeat turned off. So you can see <laughs> there's a lot of weird things going on in here. So I have a feeling we still have some problems with something, some kind of a component. I'm not happy with it. So we need to try to find, either find some schematics for this thing or possibly just do some kind of dead reckoning on this as, as we would say in the airline industry. <laughs> so let's see what we can come up with. So this preamp only has, other than the four big filter capacitors, there's only four electrolytics in this whole thing. And it's these four 4.7 microfarad 63 volt caps. And you can see there's, this is one channel and this is the other channel. So these two are for the left channel and these two are for the right channel. And Let's take the 30,000 foot view here for a minute. And if we go to the right channel, we have a beep and the meter reads good. Same thing this one, not quite as good as that one, but it's okay. And when we go to this channel, very high ESR, very leaky. That one's not quite as bad. So, we do have a couple of bad capacitors. These ones over here read absolutely perfect. So, these little small ones, and again, I don't know if these are in the signal path, or I have a feeling they are the bypass capacitors. 
not necessarily that but those will affect low frequencies so I'm gonna replace them and we're gonna see if that makes any difference I think it might make a little but I don't know that that'll totally fix it but who knows I might be <laughs> eating my words here okay just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here here's just the basic ESR meter and if you recall they how they tested in circuit you will see they test the same way out of circuit this thing will work in and out of circuit and you can see that one's relatively high ESR but barely in the good these ones here they're bad but none of them are perfect none of them are very low ESR and then if you go to a meter we're gonna test this at one kilohertz this will let you test it at different frequencies and of course this is in the audio path I'm assuming and so you wanna test it not just at low frequency like you would in it for a power supply for a linear power supply you can see that one's reading high on the capacitance but it's also reading high on ESR and I would imagine the leakage on this is not very good we could check that on the leakage meter and then we'll go to this one and we can see that one's a little closer to the correct capacitance but you can see the ESR is almost double the other one they all read somewhat different so they are worn they are bad and you can see that one's reading high ESR and a little bit low on the capacitance and then this last one and you can see it's reading high and not very good ESR but better than the other ones so they're all four they're bad all right the new capacitors are in and the two signals are superimposed over one another so you can see right now they're tracking very well and if I go and crank up the 80 Hertz slider on the equalizer now it still gets all wonky looking you can see but if you notice it does not phase shift anymore now so still not perfect but definitely an improvement so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at some of these transistors and look at the signals going through them now without a schematic this is not going to be very easy we're going to have to kind of look at the traces on the bottom of the circuit board and see if we can figure out what transistor is doing what so once I get there and I get something to show you, I'll be back. All right, we got a couple of things going on here. So I'm focused down, if I, you can see where we're at. And this is kind of the, the whole amplifier section of the preamp. And looking in here, all of these transistors up into the, this one here and this one here, they're all kind of like what I would call the buffer transistor. So your signal comes in, they pass through this section, then they go out these wires here. These wires here, this one and this one goes over and they go over to the equalizer sliders. Then it comes back and it goes into these transistors and these transistors out here and then out to the outputs the signals if we measure them prior to all of this let me move you up to the scope and it doesn't matter what frequency I tried all five frequencies feeding that in there they all react exactly the same way so I do not think it is the equalizer but here's the inputs and you can see I'm at 15 kilohertz because that was the last frequency I tested and they're perfectly clear and it doesn't matter if I adjust the volume or if I adjust the sli tone sliders it doesn't matter it stays perfectly clean but as soon as I get out to the outputs you can see right now it looks good but as soon as I start increasing it 
you can see how it gets all distorted looking and if I go to the other channel it clips but it's much higher amplitude before it clips and if I bring it out of clipping like this and go to the other channel you can see it's lower amplitude and it's clipping so the two channels are acting very different from one another and I do think we have a bad transistor if not two bad transistors at least one is bad and it's one of those four in there the bigger problem is looking in the power supply section if I focus you in on that and we zoom in here I don't know if it'll focus when it's zoomed this far in let me come out a little bit there it goes these two resistors are absolutely blistering hot this transistor over here the the pass transistor it's cool and everything else seems to be okay the filter capacitors all seem to be okay but those resistors are blistering hot so it tells me somewhere we have a bad component or a shorted component or something so we need to get to the bottom of that first so here's where we are with the power supply taking this apart you can see this transistor this resistor here is really a bit hot and this one is hot from being in proximity I think and if you look here you can see the burn marks and next to it there was this little diode which I assume must be a Zener diode because it's connecting in over here I think this is setting a certain voltage and when I look at it it looks it says C43 is what I see if you can see it on there I don't know if it'll show it C43 so I'm assuming that's a 43 volt Zener diode which those high voltage Zeners are not <laughs> So let's dig out the Zener diode tester and let's see if we can get this to work and see what this is. I'm thinking it's a Zener. And sure enough, there it is, 43 volts. And if I change the current, it tracks very nicely. So this is a good Zener diode, which is, these higher voltage Zeners tend to fail, but this one's good. And this is what I'm finding in the whole thing. Uh, I statically measured this 2N3055. It never even gets warm, but it tests good. It doesn't seem to be shorted, although really you need to remove it and test it and these capacitors that's a little different story these are well they don't read bad in ESR so I really ran kinda of scrutinized these a little bit and let's see if I can come out a little bit And if I go down the line here and flip them around Let's turn this off and reset it. You can see that one's good. That one's good. That one's good. And that one's good. And I put them up on the LC53, which is my capacitor analyzer, and they read strangely enough the leakage read very good on them they read low leakage however the capacitance of them read very very high in other words all of these 500 microfarads were reading anywhere from 700 to 900 microfarads now I know you usually have plus or minus 20 plus 20 percent minus 10 percent but that that seemed a bit high same thing with uh, this thousand microfarad it read 1500 but again none of them read really bad leakage however if I put them on the ICO 950 as soon as I came up above like 30 volts or so the the eye didn't close but it went to high leakage and just stayed there also 
the LC53 will only test a capacitor for leakage at 50 volts and 100 volts. Those are kind of the things. These are 75 volt caps. So if you look, it's rated at 75. At 50 volts, they read low leakage or decent leakage for this size of a cap. At 100 volts, they read dead short, which you would expect them to read bad when you're above their rated voltage. But typically, 25 volts higher than this, you would read a little bit of leakage, but not terrible. So my tests on these caps are inconclusive. On top of that, this one is bulged. You can see this one here is good. This one here doesn't look bulged. And this one looks good. But that one looks a little bit bulged. So I have them out. What do I do? Well, if I have some in stock, I'll replace them. If I do not have them in stock, I'll probably put them back in. But that's kind of my thought on that. I don't think these are causing that resistor to get hot like that. Uh, I'm going to have to look into this a little more carefully, but I'm kind of going through with you my thoughts on all of this. This is a strange power supply because it's a single rail, so you just have your transformer coming in here. They rectify it through a bridge, and then it must be, you know, 60 volts or so, you know, higher voltage. And then it goes through this dropping network and this regulator, and, a must dr and when it comes out, it's 43 volts. There is a 43 volt output on one of these. And you can see there's different voltages. So there's ground, there's what they call L, which is low voltage, I'm assuming. Then there's LB plus and HB plus, which I'm assuming are low B plus and high B plus. Now, what they might be doing is they might be taking that Zener diode in this transistor and they may be making kind of a split rail power supply, like a positive and negative. But I really got to look at this a little more carefully to see what they're trying to do with this. This is an odd power supply. It's simple. There's all your components. You know, here, those four caps went there and the Zener went here. But other than that, there's your power supply. I'd love to have a schematic to see this. I mean, I guess we could reverse engineer this. Maybe I should. So from what I can see, this is the schematic of that board. And it's a little bit strange. It's a weird power supply, for sure. So it just comes out of a single winding of the little transformer. Goes through a bridge rectifier. They filter it with this first capacitor, which is 500 microfarads at 75 volts. It then branches off. You have this that big resistor, which was this 1.5K at 2 watts. And all it does is it goes out to pin L, which they're calling this pin right here. And that goes up and to the light. Now this was rather toasty. It was getting very hot. And so I looked a little bit more closely into this light. I disassembled it. So you had the little light pipe and you had an incandescent bulb, which obviously is a relatively high voltage bulb, I would imagine, to have just a 1.5K with that kind of voltage. And what I noticed when I cleaned this bulb up was the filament had partially broken and then shorted back together so it was lighting up. That's why it wasn't working and then it started working. And I believe the shortened filament that had kind of fused itself to the middle in there caused excessive current until finally it burned out again, but that's what was overheating this, this resistor. So as we measured, it's out of tolerance and so it needed replaced. These two resistors are also drifted way high. They're 50% high. Both of them are over 150. And one of them is almost 200 ohms. The other is 160 ohms almost. And those would be these two resistors here and here. And they're only little one watt resistors. So it comes out of this first one, gets filtered with a second capacitor, 
So you have a little pie network here is what, for filtering. Then it comes up through a 3.3K half watt resistor and goes into this little network for the base of your regulator transistor. And they're regulating the base with this 43 volt Zener diode that we were looking at. And then they have another one of those 500 microfarad capacitors at 75 volts filtering the base on this. Then it goes through a, a 10 ohm resistor and into the base and then you have this 0.12 film capacitor going from the base to the collector and then you come out of the so then it goes through this other 100 ohm resistor into the collector gets turned on here and then it passes through your emitter and that goes to what's what they're calling HB plus which I'm thinking they're saying meaning high B plus then there's a 150 ohm resistor and that's where we see that thousand microfarad 50 volt go into ground and they're calling that low B, B plus or LB plus so you can see that all right here HB plus LB plus and L then you have ground which is right here so it's a fairly simple power supply the L by itself is where if we look here L and ground L goes straight up and into that 1.5 K off of the rectifier so that's this here so there it is you have two different voltages and I don't you know 150 ohm dropping resistor I can't imagine there's a huge difference between these two but these two wires come off of those two pins and they go onto the preamp board and that's what powers the whole preamp and it's just as simple as that it's just a simple linear regulated power supply and I guess for what it is it works so we've rebuilt that and hopefully that'll take care of that now again I don't think rebuilding this is going to solve our problem I still think we have a bad transistor because of the asymmetrical clipping we're getting on one channel and not the other and we're also seem to be getting more gain on one channel than the other and I before you mention it I did consider the fact that the resistors right and left channel of the of the volume pot might not be tracking equally but the only reason I don't think that's the problem is because not only is the amplitude lower on one channel than the other but the one with the lower amplitude also clips earlier if all that was wrong was that the pot was not slide was not tracking linearly you know between right and left side then all that would happen is the amplitude would be lower on one side than the other but it would still clip at the same amplitude if that makes sense to you so I'm really still hanging on that I think we have a bad transistor but we now have a nice clean power supply our drifted resistors have been replaced this is going to get replaced I don't know if I have an incandescent bulb but we can certainly put another dropping resistor and make up an LED if we have to so that's no problem at all and since this is regulated the LED will not flicker or anything like that it should look good alright so pulled these off the board this is the 1.5 K at least the way it looks and it's reading really low and these are the 200 ohm 1 watt and that one's reading high and that one's reading high so they were all bad they needed replaced so anyway I went ahead and I rebuilt the board and I was able to dig through my stash and I found these 470s at 100 so they worked although they're radial instead of axial axial caps are getting really expensive and hard to find replace these with metal oxide 
or metal film, I'm sorry, these are metal film resistors. Everything else checked out good. And uh, I did have one axial and oh my goodness, the capacitor snobs are going to go crazy. It's Illinois capacitor. I don't think I've ever seen any videos I've posted with these that somebody hasn't rolled their nose up when they saw that. Heavens a Yale man! But honestly, I've not had any problems with them really. But, good heavens, Illinois capacitors. Anyway, it's all rebuilt. We're going to get it back in there and see if it works. Hopefully this will fix this problem and then we can get back to tracing. I still really believe there's a bad transistor in that other section. Okay, the power supply is now fixed and everything is working a little bit better. But as you can see, we still have a little bit of this channel is starting to clip on one side before the other channel. They are tracking together pretty close now, but I still think either a transistor or a resistor has drifted out of value in the one channel. All right, you can just barely see I got all of this in the shot. And if I go to the left channel here, you can see we have a nice sine wave and we go to the right channel you can see how it's beginning to clip so we know that, that it's this side over here that our problem is and it can only be anything from these last two transistors forward uh, prior to that well no we got clipping there too so it's happening clear back there so we need to look even behind that. So let me poke around a little more and we'll see where we're, where we're at. All right, I hope you can see all this. So if I go to the very first transistor here on the left channel that's good, if I go, you can see we have a good, st good signal there, a good signal there, and we have a very small signal here. So looking at base emitter and collector, and of course we can, you can see. If I go to the other channel, to that same transistor, you can see already you have your clipping. And if I go over here, I do not have clipping. And if I go to the and you can see what a weird looking signal I have here on this. So, yeah, we either have a bad transistor or a bad capacitor. And really, there's only one capacitor, and it's a film capacitor. I really don't think that's the issue. So I think we have a bad transistor in there. We're going we're gonna to swap it out and see what happens. Okay, I have removed and replaced the offending transistor. And if we look now, it's clean, clean, and that funny looking square bump is gone. So that fixed that. However, when we move over to here, we still are getting clipping. You can see the yellow trace is still clipping just a little bit, not as bad. And if we go back, let's see if I can get you back in shot here. Right about there. Let me tighten this. You can see when we get to this stage, you have a lot more output now. And it's not, it's not distorting at all. See that? So now, but if I look at the outputs, now this output stage is still doing it. So now we have to look and see. It's still there. It's still there. Let's see if we have the input. And not getting anything here. Hold on. It looks clean there, see it? It's clean there. And it's distorted there. 
So now we have another one that we're probably going to have to replace. So the next one down from it. So I started doing a little bit of comparative measurements between the two channels. And if you look right here and here is where the equalizer ties in, the equalizer circuit. And if I read, the, so this little track, the little trace underneath the circuit board, this is the ground plane here in the middle. And you can see this resistor and capacitor, they are in parallel. This is a 100 picofarad mica capacitor, and this is a 1 mega ohm resistor. And when I am in, when I measure them, and compare them, let's see if we can get everything in shot here. If I go in ohms mode, let's unplug this, and I go from here to here, you can see it's very high resistance. And if I go over here on the good channel, it reads 13 kilo ohms or 13 K roughly. Now here's the strange thing. If I push the EQ defeat button, see there, and I go here, now the good channel reads 1 mega ohm or that capacitor, and this channel still reads the same. It doesn't really change it very much. And if you look here, we still have that little bit of clipping on that channel, on the bad channel. And if I hit EQ defeat, everything's perfect. Now you can see they're a wee little bit, and that's, that's the potentiometer difference between the one side of the slider and the other for right and left channel. But it's good. If I turn the equalizer back on, I get that funny looking clipping. And... It has to do with that measurement being different. So something in the equalizer circuit is not working properly. And that's what we got to find out why it's doing that. Now, that does not mean that that transistor wasn't bad. So if you look here, there was a couple things. These transistors I don't believe were bad. Although I replaced them, I'm just going to leave them in. This one was absolutely bad because if you remember, using our oscilloscope, when I measured the three pins around there, this one had, had really bad clipping on it. Once I put this new one in there, the clipping here went away, and it got us down to, instead of both sides clipping off like it was, you just have that little bit of clipping at the bottom. If I put that bad transistor back in, it'll clip up here, and it'll clip harder down here. So there is definitely a bad transistor, but there's also something else wrong, and it could just be something as simple as that switch is not clicking properly, not making good contact, or something in here. But really, this is a passive equalizer. In other words, it's, there's no active components in there. It's just these coils and all of these film capacitors. Although, I don't know if the camera can get that close and I can get enough light in here, but... If I put the light in here, you can just barely make out these couple of caps. One here and one here. Right there and there. See those little silver ones? Those are tiny, teeny little electrolytics. They look like because they have a plus and minus symbol on them. And uh, maybe one of those is bad. I don't know. I have to pull the board to make sure. Okay, I don't know if you could see this. Very tiny, but this is a tiny little electrolytic capacitor and if you see how it says R22 that means it is 22 nanofarads so it's R22UF it is actually 22 nanofarads rated at what is it 25 volts I think 35 volts so you can just see 35 volts and if we read this one It's reading a little bit high, 
232 nanofarads, but it's showing an ESR of 5.2 ohms. That's pretty crazy. And then if we go to the other one from the other channel, we do the same test. It reads 173 nanofarads. V loss is 0.2% and there is no ESR that's measurable by this. So definitely one of these is bad. All right, so those are going to get replaced with some nice film capacitors and then we'll never have to worry about them leaking or going bad or anything ever again. So that's what we're going to put in and there's a couple, there's two more that are one microfarad each and we're going to have to test those as well when we're done with these. Okay, here's the one microfarad. <laughs> well, that would explain that one, huh? That one is reading 391 ohm resistance. And this is a 1 microfarad 35 volt capacitor. 1 microfarad 35 volts. All right, let's look at the other one. And it's good. 1,088 nanofarads, meaning 1.088 microfarads. Yep, so those need replaced as well. And those will get replaced with film capacitors also. All right, everything's all scrunched in there now, so let's see how it works. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> that didn't fix it. And still, if I turn the equalizer off, but what I am finding is something pretty interesting. I don't know why turning the equalizer on and off would affect it, but if I look over here, the output transistor that drives the very final stage, if I look at it over here, we obviously have the signal there with the clipping, and I can show it to you. You can see it. But if I go to the base signal to look at what's coming in on the base, you can see it's pretty distorted. <laughs> All right, this transistor is a 2N4036. I don't know if you can see it or not. Probably not. There it is, 4036. And that crosses over to an SK3025, which I have. These are really good transistors. They're also getting really hard to find, so those, these are getting expensive to find good original stock of them. I'm sure there's a lot of fakes out there and replicas, but, well, it's what we need, so that's what we'll do. And by the way, the other ones, those SAE 4010s, those little ones, I replaced those with 2N5551s. So let me get this put in and uh, let's see what it does. I have that transistor tacked in there and you can see it makes no difference. So it's coming back out, going back in the package and the old one's going back in. Okay, I am so close, you see that? And it turns out that I replaced this transistor. See, I replaced that one originally. I now replaced this one. That turned out to be where the problem was, was at the base. The base of that transistor was leaky. So here's the old one. And as this transistor warms up and settles, you can see it's getting more and more and more settling down and right there they're very close now and you can see I have perfect symmetrical clipping on the blue channel and I'm just a little bit off on the yellow channel but it's so close that it doesn't start to show up until you can see right there there's no clipping at all hardly and then I go just a little bit more you can just see it to start to clip so I think I'm gonna leave that you're never going to drive the amp at this level. 
I, you know, I have everything pretty well cranked. <laughs> It just goes to show how how sensitive those transistors are. They, if there's the teeniest little bit of leakage, and really even a curve tracer sometimes will show that, but sometimes a proper curve tracer will not even show these little noise problems like this. So you really have to test them in circuit, which is what I said on the last video. There is no other way to do this. And of course we don't have a schematic, so that made it a little more difficult. But as you see now, this, this is the tone slider. Remember how just distorted and horrible it looked when I moved up and down? Now it's tracking very well. And you can see they kind of separate a wee little bit. That's just because of the, the difference between the two sections of the potentiometer. And that's normal. You're going to see that. Unless you used a stepped attenuator, you're never going to have them track perfectly. But you know, for how old this thing is, <laughs> it's pretty darn good. So to review what we did, we replaced a couple of transistors that didn't need it, but this transistor was bad right here, and this transistor was bad right here, and they weren't shorted, they just had, they were noisy, and they distorted the signal a little bit probably because they had a little bit of leakage in them which does not show up <laughs> on a normal little transistor checker. We also found that the capacitors over here were bad moving over and that would be one of these 22 nanofarads and one of these 1 microfarads was bad. The 1 microfarad was shorted and the 122 nanofarad was leaky and out of tolerance. We also found that one of these resistors was cooked. And I think part of that, well, I think this one changed tolerance because, or changed values and drifted because that the light bulb shorted on it. And I think these went bad because those capacitors were leaking at least under full load. Although you couldn't really tell when you tested them. I put them on all the different testers and they for the most part tested good. So once again you can have all the testing machines on earth. It's not going to always show everything. So anyway we have this all rebuilt. So we rebuilt the power supply, replaced the two transistors, replaced the four capacitors, and we did a general recap on the thing. Clean the controls, and there we are. So let's put it all together. All connected back up, all put together. We have our sweep signal connected, and you can see that it's working very well. And I just have that 10 hertz to 22 kilohertz sweep signal. And you can see how nice and flat it's responding. And if I go down and I turn up the uh, equalizers, we can turn them on. So it's on right now. Here's the 1280. I have it cranked up. And you'll see it here just in a minute. see that <laughs> it goes off the scale and then when it passes through that band let's go to the 5 kilohertz and we'll watch it sweep and you can see there's the 5 kilohertz band and when it gets on the other side of that it drops back down just like it should and if I go to the 15 kilohertz That works. And let's go to the 80 hertz, which is the low fre lowest frequency. It's not working. Okay, so we still have a problem with our equalizer. We're going to have to look at that. Okay, so we determined that the 80 hertz slider is not working, but all the other ones work perfectly. I'm going to show you the back of the filter board for the equalizer and maybe you can help me troubleshoot what's wrong. <laughs> I 
Anybody see? Yeah, we put those capacitors in there, which is really nice, those one microfarads, but it, they would work much better if they were soldered in. Let's fix that. Okay, where were we now? 80 hertz, working perfectly. And notice how the, the signal does not distort, nor does the frequency shift, you know, the, the phase shift between the two channels. It's perfect. And I guess while I have the cover off, I can show you my little LED mod that I did. It's nothing special. But if you look back here, I took an LED light and I connected it to the light pipe and just put a little sleeving over it and then a heat shrink to hold the sleeving. And then that went over to here to the power board. And Underneath this sleeving is a 100K resistor. Yes, 100K. <laughs> to dim down the light to where, where it's not, you know, seen from low Earth or orbit. And uh, to get the current way down on it. Because there's almost 70 volts there. That's a lot of power for a LED. So, and there you go. You can see the light looks pretty good and the camera makes it look actually a lot brighter than it is it's actually just the right brightness you can see it very well but it's not glaring all right I'm back so uh, um, before we part for this video I want to show you one last interesting thing I have the unit unplugged I have the switch turned off and I plug it in and you can see the indicator light comes on and then when I turn it on it comes on a little brighter the reason we get that little bit of glow is how how sensitive that LED is on the power switch there are two capacitors they're big ceramic discs and those are the noise filter capacitors and they're across the switch contacts and those capacitors actually have enough they pass enough current to energize the power supply in this thing a little bit of course it doesn't come up to full power but it it does put a tiny little residual current in there and that's what's lighting this light up it, if i remove those capacitors they they're original to the to the circuit that would go away but those caps are in there across the switches uh for noise and you know debounce of the switch and so forth so anyway that's what that is I thought that was interesting okay I just randomly grabbed the first thing that popped up on the audio library because it looked cool called electro fight so we're going to listen to electro fight and uh, we're all set flat right now the one thing I will tell you is the audio interface on this uh, th this Scarlet 2i2 that I have, it is kind of temperamental with this computer. Watch when I move the mouse, you should be able to hear it. Listen. Hear that? And that buzzing noise you're hearing is, again, coming from the audio interface. The amplifier and preamp is dead silent when you take those off of there. So, you know, when you disconnect the, the audio interface. So, anyway... It's good enough for us. It does have good dynamic range and good sound, so I'm anxious. Let's hear what Electro Fight sounds like. Here we go. And then we'll demonstrate the equalizer while we're playing this.
well, there you have it. So, uh, that was loud. I'm anxious to see how this turns out in the recording because it was crystal clear. I mean, my, my chest was compressing from this bass. I mean, literally it was that powerful. I mean, my ears, <laughs> I could feel the pressure inside my ears, but it wasn't distorted. I, I, I can't believe that it did not kind of overdrive the input of the microphone. So we'll see about that. I hope you can hear me on the microphone, by the way because it's not registering near as loud as the music was. So anyway, that's it. And uh, another one done, huh? So in the meantime, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, let me switch over to my other microphone. So we're going to call this one a wrap. And I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And I just want to let you know that uh, I had a lot of good comments about that random comments video I did. That a lot of you would like to see me continue that with that same format. It was a really good opportunity for me to talk about things that I may not talk about in a separate video. And maybe do some things that might not always be related to electronics and more importantly to answer some of your questions and comments which uh, I think a lot of you really appreciated that so I'm gonna try another one and we'll see how it goes but in the meantime we'll get this one posted and I wish you all well and we'll see you again real soon take care bye bye